Alright, what's up everyone and welcome to a very special edition of We Rise Fighting Labor Podcast. As always, I'm Rick Urrutia here with my co-host Brian Pfeiffer. In today's episode, we bring you an interview with two union members, both involved in their strike efforts at their respective academic institutions. One is from Rutgers University and the other from the University of Michigan. Our podcast has been covering the strikes at both universities for a couple of months now, so we decided to reach out to the striking unions to see if we could get the story directly from the members. The U.S. is seeing a a growing wave of strikes and organizing in higher education, so our guests are here to help us understand what's going on. Before we officially begin, we would like to take a moment to dedicate this episode to the spirits of Harry Belafonte and Paul Robeson. Both Harry Belafonte and Paul Robeson left us with a vision of what a better, more just world could look like. They will not be forgotten, and their spirits continue with us in our struggles. Now, we'd like to kick things off with our guests by having y'all introduce yourselves. Please and thank you. Okay, well, I, I'm Hank Hallett. I am a, we call it part-time lecturer, though we're, 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 we're the name, our names are going to be changing. Our titles are likely to be changing through this process. So essentially what I am is an adjunct. I teach journalism uh, in the School of Communications at Rutgers uh, University in uh, on the New Brunswick campus. And uh, I've been a working journalist for much of my adult life, um, a writer, uh, and I've been teaching for about 10 years at Rutgers now. Um, as an adjunct, I, I unfortunately have to teach at multiple schools. So I'm also at uh, two of the uh, community colleges in the state of New Jersey as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm also a Rutgers alum, uh, which is interesting for me being on campus um, over these 10 years and uh, kind of taking on a different role. So, um, yeah, I don't know what else you guys need from me in terms of bio, but that's that's a start anyway. Yeah, that's certainly a start. And maybe real quick, you know, what got you involved in the union? What got what politicized you? What raised your consciousness to, you know, participate in this? Well, I, I've always been politicized in terms of my writing. Um, but I, I think I realized I was probably more of an armchair um, activist <laughs> than I was an actual activist until this happened. Um I started to engage with the union. Um, there's some back history that I'm I'm not probably the best person to describe, but there were some issues with the last contract, some disagreements with the, mem- the, the leadership that um, was in place at that time. The leadership was voted out. Um, the new uh, leadership started holding um, union-wide meetings, um, town halls, and inviting every single member um, and I, you know, I was, I've been a member since, um, I started teaching like the first or second semester, I started paying my dues, um, but I wasn't active, uh, but they started opening things up and inviting as many people to participate. So I started going to a couple of town halls and I said, well, you know what, I've got all this background in newspapering and media. I could help with the media committee. Well, there, and that was, that's how I entered the rabbit hole. <laughs> gotcha. The more the more engaged, the more I participated in the media committee, the more I found an affinity with the people who are um, on the board. The more I got involved with them, the more I more active I wanted to become. I ran for the board um, uh, to the point now where um, you know we, we have a real activist board, so executive board. Um, so most of us are you know we're either out on the picket lines or in the uh, negotiating rooms. Um, and which is, um, I think how it should be, you know, we're, we're saying we, you know, we, we want to win this. So, um, we all, we all kind of put the, put a, put a bit of our sweat into it. Um, and I, I appreciated that, that kind of thing and the kind of camaraderie that, um, being an active member of the union provided me. So as I got at more active, I got more active. It was, it was exponential. Um, it, in, in, in a way, um, I feel closer and more connected to my campus and to the Rutgers community. This is, you know, and I'm coming as somebody who's a, who's a graduate of Rutgers. I am more connected to the community, the campus, and what happens at Rutgers now than I've ever been. Um, and that's, I think that's, uh, that is, that's very much because of my engagement with the union. So. Um, Got it. Got so, it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And in and uh, presumably we you're calling in from Ann Arbor, uh, but certainly from Geo. Uh, we also have Jaeger. Jaeger, can you introduce yourself a little bit? What got you involved in the union? What got you involved in the strike? 
Yeah. Hey, um, I'm SN Yeager. I use they, them pronouns. I, at this point, am a fourth year PhD candidate in classical studies, which is uh, not a field that is particularly well known for its uh, union involvement and activism. We're maybe more known for uh, stealing things from other countries and white supremacy. Um, so I came to the University of Michigan, my PhD, straight from a master's program, and I came straight from a bachelor's program to get the master's. So I have only ever known academia. Um, there has not been a year in my life since probably when I was three, when I was not in school in some way. Um, so in terms of union involvement, my... Uh, my history in academia led up to 2020, my first year of my PhD, everything in the world fell apart. At least that's how it felt for me. Uh, I had just moved to a new place. I didn't really have a lot of good connections yet in the community. I didn't really have a lot of direction, but I was paying enough attention to the world in general to know that um, my existential angst was not going to get better if I didn't find something to do. And um, luckily, I happened to look at my email one day and see, oh, my union's about to go on strike. I don't know anything about unions. I don't know anything about striking, but that seems like a really good way to distract myself from my growing depression that hadn't been diagnosed yet. So I got, in terms of timing, I got real lucky that Geo went on strike in 2020 because a strike is a great time to get involved because there are so many jobs and so many ways to fit into your union or your community. So I also got very lucky that in my department of classical studies, the graduate students are really well organized. So we have had members of the bargaining team for the last few bargaining cycles. We have had um, chairs of committees. We have had constitutional officers in the union and in general have just a really good group of graduate students who understand that we're not just here to do research. We're here to contribute to a community and build something. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have been so fortunate to um, uh, grow as a organizer in a really good environment in my department. So we went on strike in 2020, and a month after I signed my yellow card, I was running a base camp in the middle of campus in the middle of a pandemic. I didn't know anything about unions. I didn't know anything about striking, but like I uh, grew up in a conservative setting where we had a lot of potlucks and I knew how to run a group of people so we could make sure everyone had snacks and water. And that was enough to get me involved in running the base camp. After we got off of strike, I was elected head steward of our stewards council. So that's a council of all the representatives from departments. From there, last year I was elected secretary of the union, and now this year I have been one of the co-chairs of our queer and trans caucus and an active uh, strike organizer. I am not the only uh, runner of base camp. Uh, we have a fantastic headquarters team amongst many other strike committees, um, so that's allowed me to not be on campus all day every day like I was in 2020, and I... Um, have been helping a lot more with uh, trans bargaining. So I went from this time in 2020 knowing absolutely nothing about unions to now having had multiple roles. Uh, and uh, that's all thanks to uh, the amount of mentoring in my union and the willingness for people to get involved. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. Uh, you know, could, could I, I, I mean, this is what's interesting to me. Um, there are a lot of interesting things that you said, but the pandemic plays into this, I think, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, the history, our understanding, my understanding, because again, I came to the union after the pandemic. Um, and uh, one of our um, full time uh, faculty members who's who's been very involved on a merch, who's a historian, she's been talking a lot about how the how the the pandemic made everybody realize just how precarious their existences were and you know we knew grads knew that they were precarious adjuncts have always known that we're precarious full-timers didn't fully get it until they were forced to move their classes online 
do things without a whole lot of help from the university um, until they lost access to, you know, their grad assistants until suddenly their lives were upended as well. They understood the, some of the things that we were dealing with. And I think from, from our perspective at Rutgers, that really triggered a change in the way that we went about thinking about organizing and contracts and all of that. And we, because, because of the, the the difficulties surrounding the pandemic, um, we started organizing across lines, across different, um, both bargaining units and across um, different categories, uh, just be, because we had to. We realized that um, all of us are in, in a similar boat. What happens to the least of us, the PTLs or the adjuncts, the grad students, will have an effect on um, the full-time faculty. They're, they are going to feel whatever happens to us. Uh, excuse me to us um and in in ways that i think they they didn't understand before so got it all right and you know in preparing for today's interview i was going through some of my notes and i reread an article where uh, a professor i don't know if you know this person hank uh deepa kumar yeah uh, she teaches in my department okay there you go so she was so she was quoted in this articles as saying that there have been 15 graduate student worker strikes in recent history. I can't remember if that's like the last year or the last two years, whatever it is in recent history. And so my question is to the two of you, um, maybe Jaeger first and then Hank, uh, to the two of you is what direction is all this going in and what significance does that have? Um, you know, what should other workers who aren't graduate workers take away from your guys' struggles, your guys' strikes? So something, or maybe two things that are cool about being a union at a university is that, well, especially at a University of Michigan at a public university, is that we know exactly what the University of Michigan is able to do. Like we have their finances, we have their resources, we know the pull they have in the community. So, I don't know if this would be true for uh, many other unions or industries, but at the University of Michigan, we are uniquely positioned to win workers' rights in realms like uh, disability or trans health, because those are things that the University of Michigan is working towards in some way or has resources that it could send in that direction. So I think we are positioned in a way to expand what unions can do just because of the, the um, field that we're playing in currently. In addition, something cool about being a uh, higher ed union is that all of our students are going to know what it like, what effect a union has in a workplace. Mm. So when I I mean, I grew up in Chicago suburbs, uh, somehow did not know anything about unions just because it wasn't something I paid attention to. I grew up pretty conservative. So um, Ronald Reagan was here to save us, not unions. Um, but now all of the students at University of Michigan, I mean, they're going through it because grad students and lecturers and everyone else who is involved in our actions right now makes a big difference for undergrads. But I think something that we'll see in the in the future will be younger people unionizing newer places just because they now know that unionization is possible for them or they now know what is possible through a union for them and the importance of community in any workplace. Not in like a fake business, we're a family way, but in a we stand up for us and we protect us kind of way. Beautiful. And Hank, for you, same question. You know, where is all this going? Lots of stuff going on. Yeah, I think I think what's interesting is um, I think you're right. I mean, we have we have examples in the in the economy of younger workers in industries that have never really been organized before starting to do that. So we're watching this as Starbucks, Starbucks workers in the service economy who have been who've been. I don't know if I can curse on <laughs> on here. It, it would been shit on, right? As a, as a general rule, who have no control over their schedule, who have no control over the number of hours they're going to work, who have who who most most of whom have no access to healthcare, have suddenly realized that there's a way for them 
to win those things, the kinds of things that all of us should be entitled to, right? So, so they have been organizing. Uh, workers at Amazon are have been organizing across the country. Target, Walmart, we're seeing campaigns in all of these industries, and I think that's because people are starting to realize that that the only way that we can kind of fight back against the you know corporate power is to is to you know unify and to speak as not just as a bunch of individuals but as a collective voice so i think that's happening on the one side in academia you know there's been this push pull for years the um i've been writing a lot about this the um Academia has become very corporate focused. It's very it, it functions like any capitalist institution at this point. The goals of academia, which are which should be the mission of academia, should be education and research, right? And that that's what that's what we're supposed to be about. But what's happened is that it is uh, everything has been tied to budgets everything is tied to how do we expand the size of our endowments how many how do we expand the size of our reserves how do we avoid spending anything so this has infected um every element of of, of academia i think um you know in the sciences you have um so many of the classes so many of the programs dependent on going to corporations for grants to do research and if they cannot justify the research and win a grant from, you know, a, a drug company or something, they're not going to be able to do that research. It affects their, you know, there's a bottom line effect there. Um, in 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 other areas, you know, we're we're seeing academia push out the, you know, to try try to eliminate the notion of tenure. So they've been limiting that. And if you go back 40, 50 years, you'd see that. Two thirds to three quarters, probably three quarters of all classes, say in 1980, 1990 even, were taught by full time tenure or tenure track faculty. Right now, one in three, maybe one in four, are taught by full time tenure track faculty. At Rutgers, adjuncts teach a third of the classes. We are paid significantly less than anybody else. But we teach the same classes. We we provide the same service to students that anybody else would. Graduates and non tenure track other contract um, faculty teach another third or so of the classes. So you can see. I mean, the the, the shift has been purposeful. It's you know it's that kind of you know model that we saw in the auto industry where they only keep enough inventory on you know so that they could turn it around quickly. It's the same thing at academia. We hire people who we can fire easily. No more tenure. That's their their goal because then they they have the flexibility that they want. But it puts a lot of impact it's a lot of impact on the communities that surround these schools. Um certainly on the people who are teaching. Um you know I don't know, um, and hopefully this contract that we we're still working on will provide me with a little bit more security. I won't have to worry from semester to semester if I'm the odd man out, right? Um, I won't have to, you know, worry that you know my pay might be enough to allow me to maybe only teach at two schools, right, instead of three. Um, so, um, you know, I think that academia is, you know, has been following the corporate model for a long time, and and maybe um, maybe we have an opportunity to kind of demonstrate that the corporate model can be fought back against. I don't know. And you know, this has uh, come up a couple of times, but I I was hoping we could dig a little deeper with this question, and uh, this time I'm going to pitch it to you first, Hank. Um, you know, what has been the response from the students? Uh, what kind of support has a strike gotten from the community? Um, and what what would you like to communicate to the broader community? Say someone listening to this podcast, I'm situated in Denver, you know, some <coughs> teachers, professors in Denver or, or graduate student workers in Denver, what would you like to communicate to the broader community and what has the support been? Yeah, we, we've had significant support from students. Um, it's not universal. I mean, there, you know, there are students who took the 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 week off from classes and kind of got signed because it was it was really hot that week. Um, but a lot of students were on the line with us. A lot, uh, uh, I would say, a quarter of the people who joined us on the line um, were probably students. Um, one of the things that we did, and I think is was really important in in 
in the lead up is that especially the adjuncts like you know our union we talked to every we, we we asked every single one of our members to talk to their classes to be honest about their situation to basically say do you know what an adjunct is do you know how much an adjunct makes does that surprise you how much do you pay in tuition for this class you know so they could start to do the math in their head and they would understand you know because five years ago before i started thinking about these things myself you know, students would be upset that I couldn't stick around after class or that I didn't have an office or office hours. But by explaining all of that, they started to see me as a person. They started to understand the the issues that prevented my being able to give them everything that I should be able to give them. So we had a lot of support from students. Um Again, but, you know, that's, you know, I always worried that um, the sport could be fickle, right? Because it's, again, we were striking at the end of the semester. Um, and that's something that that had really weighed on us heavily as we were trying to make decisions about a lot of things. Um, I just lost the thread of what we were saying. So, um, you know, so the, um, and there's a student organization on campus called Rutgers One, R1. Um, it's a coalition of us. Uh, student groups um that um the beauty of it is it's independent it's not um it's not one of these sanctioned groups that are on campus you know there are a lot of groups on campus that get fees from the university and are sanctioned by the university which are really great groups r1 is much more activist based um and they did they did a lot of the they did a lot of dirty work for us you know they they were out there they were flyering the campus they were doing a lot of work for us because they're there Right. They're on campus. They were engaged with it. It was um, and, you know, I think they learned a lot from what was what was going on. Um, so there was I think there was that um, in terms of the community, we engaged them. Um, part of our campaign involved um, something called bargaining for the common good, which has been um, something that a lot of the unions, um, especially at the higher ed are doing. But, um, you know, there was a that was a big component of one of the teacher strikes in L.A., I think, um, recently. And for us, it meant that we want, there are some things that for legal reasons and for some other reasons were not possible that we were asking for like a rent freeze. Um, but the big thing that we're after is a community fund. Um, Rutgers is housed in three communities, basically. Uh, all three are poor cities, heavily minority, either Latino or black, and Rutgers needs to be a better neighbor. So we worked with community members in those in those areas to develop this idea for a community fund. We're calling it a beloved community fund because that is a phrase that that our president, Jonathan Holloway, has used. He wants to create a beloved community at Rutgers. Um, you know, and he's talking about increasing diversity and doing a lot of really good things. But when push comes to shove, it's still he still treats us, you know, treats it as a corporate entity. And um uh, I think his definition of beloved and ours might be a little bit different, but we want to set up a fund that, you know, largely immigrant communities, um, poor communities can, you know, dip into to deal with things like rising rents and growing hunger issues and that kind of thing. So um, we've been working with community members to on that. I'll say one other thing before I kind of, um, we've also gotten, um, I think surprisingly good press coverage. Um, I say surprising because the labor beat has basically disappeared uh, in most news organizations. And most reporters, sadly, um, they they boil union issues down to um, one or two basic things. Usually it's just a money thing. And we've seen some of that during our campaign. And it's certainly something I think that really hurt the, the rail workers in the fall. The way that that was presented in the national media for uh, to a great degree dropped out their scheduling issues right this there that 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 attempted strike was about scheduling and sick time but a lot of the press made it seem like it was purely about money um we've been lucky i think we have a couple of news organizations in new jersey that um understand the nuance in what was being discussed and the other ones followed suit um so and I think part of that was that we've been cultivating those news organizations for a long time. So that's one thing I think that unions across the board need to think about how better to do, especially without a dedicated labor beat. Um, how do you go about, you know, winning the, winning the press war? 
because it's going there's going to be a press war and the press war is going to influ influence public opinion so um you know i i, I think that's uh that would be the one thing I, I i might say to other unions at least for now i may have other <laughs> other things may pop into my head okay great well if they pop up uh let us know and <laughs> jaeger for you same question what has been the role of students community support what would you say to the broader community someone in denver yeah uh so we also on strike smack at the end of the semester i think convocation and graduation are coming up here in the next couple of days so from undergrads, the support or lack thereof has been real mixed, um, which makes sense because we're at a huge university, which means there's thousands of points of view and experiences. Um, in terms of support, though, we have undergrads on every single one of our strike committees. Um, most days when I'm at HQ, there's also undergrads there running it with me. We've got undergrads on our picket lines. We've got undergrads in our uh, strategy meetings on our comms team they're an active part in it and we like we welcome it we want all, anyone in the community who wants to help us we're going to take it because the community strikes can be a better strike than just a grad student strike um in terms of actually i'll say i have so i'm not teaching this semester but i was teaching in 2020 so i know how much it sucks to Feel like you're abandoning your students, even though you're doing something for them, um, because our working conditions are, of course, their learning conditions. I have been really fortunate that I had students that I taught last semester in the fall in a great books class have come like sought me out. Like they came to a certain part of campus knowing that GEO was there, knowing that I was involved with GEO because they figured they could come say hi to me and encourage me. Um, so that's not all students, but those hey, those are my students and uh, those that's are my favorite up. students because they're mine. <laughs> that's what's up. Um, in terms of, let's see, where am I going? Broader community support. Um, Hank mentioned bargaining for the common good. We're also a BCG type of union. So, and, and that's a trick to having a successful organizing campaign or a successful strike. Have your organizing be based in the community because you're a part of the community. Um, so some of our demands come straight from the university or Washtenaw County or Southern Michigan community. So we are working for a disability cultural center, which was called for by multiple different boards and groups of faculty and other activists and uh, members of campus uh, for the last like two years now. Our abolition demands come uh, a lot from the coalition for re-envisioning our safety. I think that's right. Crow CROS. Um, and that's a community group in Washtenaw County that we're just working with. We're not coming up with solutions to solve problems in the community. We're look, working with the community to identify the problems that we think we can solve through university resources because these problems are not just community problems. There are workplace problems as well. And because we started our campaign from the beginning with community focus, that means we've had community members come out specifically because they're part of our campaign from the beginning which has been pretty cool. Um, I, in classical studies, again, really good community. We've had picket lines specifically of just members of the classical studies community, including some of our undergrads who came and brought us, I think, cookies or muffins or something. Um, so even though it's a mixed bag, the support that we're getting just means the absolute world to us and allows us to continue going. I feel like there is another question in there that I didn't get to, but I don't know. Well, what you would more. announce to the broader community outside of Ann Arbor, outside of yes. GEO? The important question. Um, all the obvious things like follow us on social media, uh, come to our virtual pickets. I think we've got one tomorrow. Well, tomorrow afternoon is Thursday. I don't know if that'll be tomorrow by the time someone hears this, but we'll, we'll have plenty. As long as we're on strike, we'll have virtual pickets. Um, there is also, I think particularly for the University of Michigan, we have a new college president and he just, um, his reputation is really important to him and his uh, public image. And I mean, that's true of the University of Michigan in general. It's all about reputation. We're like the Harvard of the Midwest or some nonsense like that, or we're the leaders and the best is what we say. And I, at this point, don't know why UM Public Affairs or UM HR keep posting on Twitter 
because we're just clowning on them. Like, graduate students are full adults with families a lot of the time, but we also can use social media in ways that usually the people on HR cannot. Um, and it doesn't, it, like, it doesn't feel like clowning on the university on Twitter maybe doesn't feel as important as being on a picket line, but those are two fights that are still really important. We can't let the University of Michigan still have a reputation for being this wonderful place for graduate students when they're doing this to us. It's important for everyone to know what the reality is for a graduate student or an undergrad or a lecturer. And I think that's not only true for um, like the University of Michigan right now in the strike, but the more we talk about labor in general, even when we're not on strike, the better we're gonna be prepared for when something happens. Um, for GEO members, if we're only paying attention when we're on strike, we're going to lose because we didn't do any of the prep work we needed to do to get here. So luckily, we've been working for the last three years. But that means everyone who's seeing that grad student workers are on strike or other higher ed unions are on strike. That means talk about unions in general and know what the situation with labor is in your own workplace or your own community, because that can be important for you down the line. All right. You know, speaking of that, I, I got to commend both your unions, um, you know, on on the Rutgers end, we caught an article where the union or some protesters marched in on a meeting of Michael Gowers, the chief financial officer. He was doing some kind of budget presentation and y'all just showed up and rallied in there. And also we also reported on University of Michigan that is the president's name pronounced, pronounced Santa Ono? Is that correct? Okay, where he was apparently supposed to do some kind of cello performance and y'all stormed in on that. I gotta say, hats off to both, that, that just gave me life. Like that was so cool. To, these people should not be comfortable. You know, these people are not offering graduate workers student wa uh, living wages. Why are they comfortable? I'll say real quick about the cello thing. We didn't do anything at the cello event. We found out about the cello event and amongst organizers started talking about, oh, do we want to like fly outside? And just the fact that like HR or someone at the university found out that we found out about it, he canceled. We didn't have to do anything. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. Um, That's right. Thank you. In maybe like the first week of our strike, he was supposed to introduce a speaker, like give an award to some scholar who does like feminist studies or something like that. And it just so happened that she is known for recommending the types of like transitional funding and uh, sexual harassment type care things for people in those situations that GEO is currently organizing for and HR is shutting us down on. So we, you know, we showed up to that and we, happen to have picket lines at multiple parts of the building. And Santa Ono just drove in circles in his SUV for 45 minutes because even Santa Ono won't cross a picket line. Uh, he knows, like he is so uh, intentional about his public image that he didn't want a picture of him get, crossing a picket line. So he just canceled the entire event. Um, oh, he has now used his SUV to run picketers into intersection so he you know he's not so good at the reputation anymore but we're winning the reputation game i think right now that's what's up yeah i think we, we had we had some similar things when with, when gower so we had planned an action around the gower speech gower is the ceo of Rutgers. um he, he's the money guy right so um and like michigan Rutgers is a public university you know and it's it's it's, it's massive um, and Gower was going to be speaking. They were they were doing it. Essentially, it's like part of their dog and pony show. They were going from different to different campuses to talk about the money, explain the budget. And we got, you know, obviously it was announced ahead of time. So we planned an action. We the original plan was just to be outside um, and maybe get a couple of people inside to ask questions. But um, we had a lot of students engaged that day and um, students have no fear. So um, they kind of, you know, as, as we made our way around the building, they found a door that was unlocked. They opened the door. People streamed into the speech. They started chanting, uh, raising signs. They shut the speech down, ended it. So it was, it was you know, it was indication that, we, you know, something more was coming. That was the week before we actually went out on strike. 
Um, the other thing is that um, our president, Jonathan Holloway, he was um, he took over during COVID as president. So um, and he came in with a lot of promise. You know, he comes from a civil rights background and um, he was seen, you know, and the unions even at the time had said, you know, we welcome you. You know, we look forward to working with you because the president immediately before him was was awful. Um, he was president during the Christie administration. I don't know how much you guys know about Chris Christie, but uh, Chris Christie once uh, in a public speech said that the, the the National Education Association should be punched in the face. So that's how he has been treating education. Um, our uh, Christie appointee, by the way, is also the chief negotiator for Rutgers right now for the for the university or the ma for management right now. Um, but Holloway came in with this fanfare, a reputation. He's a, his, a scholar of history, he's a scholar of the civil rights movement and labor. He then he sent out. You know, he's been sending uh, messages out to students. Now, in in New Jersey, there's no law that prevents public workers from striking. No law, nothing constitutional. But there's common law. Um, there's common law precedent that has allowed the courts to impose injunctions on strikes once they've started. So he was threatening that, but he was calling our strike illegal before it started. Um, and uh, one of our, um, I think it was Donna Merch also in the same, the same historian I mentioned before, they organized um, an open letter to Holloway that was signed by some of the leading lights of Civil rights and labor history. Uh, there were some, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 signatories to this letter um, asking him to back away from that pledge to seek an injunction, that it, it that it went against his own scholarship. So we thought that was really interesting. And it, it, we, you know, that was something that cuts to reputation. Um, you know, I, I don't know that the, the community fully knows the president. I don't think they would, you know, they, they, they are Rutgers, but they may not know the president of the university, but it definitely is something that, that he's concerned with. So, um, it, you know, that was organized by members of our union and, you know, we think that it had some effect, but, um, you know, we, we'll yeah. see. Yeah. You know, um, again, in preparation for today, I reread through some of our notes and I saw that the Rutgers president was hired, yeah, in 2020 during COVID. And he was hired at a salary of $785,000 a year, often universe, offered university housing, um, university car chauffeur. Um, and yeah, man, I'm, you know, again, thank you for doing that. I think that's inspiring. And I think that's something that labor needs to do more of, you know, folks, these folks should not be comfortable, you know. When and, he, and he's not the highest paid person at Rutgers, not even close. Um, the highest paid person at Rutgers and the highest paid public employee in the state of New Jersey is Greg Ciano, the football coach. Of course. Of course, as, as I'm sure in Michigan, that is the same, although it's probably being competition between Michigan and Michigan State. Right. So. <laughs> so um, let me ask you this, Hank. So we saw that part of the tactic being used is that you all have suspended the strike. You, all, you, you haven't stopped the strike. And, you know, we've been reporting on Rutgers since early March and took note of took particular note of that, because I think that's a tactic that should be incorporated more in the labor movement. You know, once you advance on something, don't let that tactic go. Keep going with it. So could you speak to that a little bit? How was that tactic arrived at? How? Well, I think it was forced on us. I mean, it's it's a really difficult, it's a contentious issue, um, even amongst the union members, um, to be honest. Um, when we had planned to start the strike out of the calendar, I think it was April 10th. Um, we were about to, we, 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 had, we were going to vote on April 9th to start the next morning. Um, in the meantime, the governor decided for some reason, he waited three weeks after we, after we announced our strike vote. Um, he waited three weeks to get involved. So he decided to get involved at the, you know, literally at the 11th hour. Um, there was a request that we not strike at all. And we, you know, we delay it. And we said, no, and we walked. Um, they made significant progress in the governor's office on a framework. Um, and 
once we got to the end of that week, the governor basically asked that um, both sides sign some documents saying that the stuff in the framework is agreed to. Um, you still have to go out and do your, you know, your temporary agreement before you know, do all the other stuff. But the the basic framework is in place now. You should be able to finish things up. Um, we agreed to suspend the strike. Um, I think with some strong arming from the governor, um, and and you know, and and some other issues that um, you know we had to contend with. Um, I still don't know. I mean, I, I'm I've been, I'm trying to be really honest with our members and you know, and publicly. I don't know if that was the right decision on our part. It's the decision we made, though. So now we are still engaged in negotiations a week and a half later, trying to button this up. It's possible. I don't know when you plan to air this. It's possible we'll have an agreement finalized by the time you go by the time this goes out, or maybe not. We, you know, there there are still some significant issues on the table. Um, but, um, you know, so would, um, would I recommend that unions suspend the strike? I think you have to look at very specific individual circumstances like we did. Um, you know, there was the strong army. There was always the threat again, New Jersey, you know, each state, state law in each state is going to dictate how far you can go with the, with, with the strike and how, how much, um, leeway you have and you know the threat of the injunction was still hanging over us and it was entirely possible that we said no we would have lost whatever would have been in the framework and then um we walk out we 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 continue the strike on monday an injunction is handed down monday afternoon we walk back out on strike on tuesday we start getting fined start getting jailed all the stuff that could happen if we violated the injunction so there were a lot of there are a lot of pieces in play here um Gotcha. You know, I don't um, you know, if you if you were striking in New Jersey and you were a private company, if you're a union at a private company, none of that is in play because there's you have the right to strike in New Jersey. You just public employees have, have limitations on that based on common law. So, um, you know, being being honest with it is it, there, there and there's contention even within our within our coalition uh, in terms of whether we did the right thing or not. Some people wanted to stay out. Some people saw that we got the best we could get. I think what we did, what, what is in the framework, most of what is in the framework is pretty um, remarkable. Um, it's far from where we we were at and the beginning. You, you know, if, if could you just clarify exactly what the framework is actually? So, yeah, so the framework, it's called the framework because it's not an actual temporary agreement. So usually it, the way that our negotiations were working is that, you know, they would negotiate on particular articles in each contract. And if both sides finally came to resolution on something, they would write out the art, the new article. It would be considered a temporary agreement. And eventually it would be part of a larger temporary agreement that um, I see. would go to the vote, go to our, our members. In this case, we didn't have all of the language hammered out. But we had some basics in place. So there were there were raises that were set. There were some other things that were agreed to on both sides. Um, and then both sides is not even there's like three or four different sides that are really involved. So that's what we signed on to. OK, we signed on to this idea of a framework with the idea that. Management would continue. Talking with us, um, they would help flesh out what was in the framework and that they would work um, actively to try and get the other things hammered out that had not been addressed. Um, there are some, I think, some legitimate reason not to trust management um, in their approach because um, they spent See, we the contract expired on uh, July first. We walked out on strike on April tenth. We had made no movement before April tenth, so there was good reason to to question whether management would would do what they were supposed to do. Um, and they, you know, it it has not been the last ten days have not been easy. Our um our negotiating team, you know, they they feel like. Uh, you know, well, first they were locked in an office at the governor's uh, at the state house, and now you know they're still dealing with management. I, I, they 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 feel really beat up because um, it's really difficult work to be sitting at that table. Um, yeah, for some, those of us who are not, and we engaged in open bargaining, so we had a lot of different people at the table. We had a lot of people watching early on, but once we went on strike, obviously our attention was elsewhere. Yeah, so um, that's 
that is yes. difficult. Right. So difficult. again, like I said, the frame the framework was is not a temporary agreement, but it does set some things in place um, that we were, that, that we were loath to lose because some of them were included, you know, very large raises and some uh, job security issues. Gotcha. Okay, and just a couple more questions for y'all. Um, Jaeger, for you, actually, because Hank already delved into it, he gave us pretty current state of the strike, current state of negotiations. Um, same question for you, Jaeger. Where are things at exactly? Yeah, we are actively bargaining right now. And as soon as I get done with this podcast, I'm going right back to bargaining. Um, today, we had a fact-finding sidebar specifically for reproductive rights and trans health care, because the amount of education we have had to do at the bargaining table, because HR has no idea how either of those systems work, and in fact would bring wrong information, including up to a month ago. They just did not know or had wrong information. Um, so we, I mean, we're still bargaining while we're on, I think the strike turns one month today or one month tomorrow or in a couple of days or something. We've been bargaining at least three times a week that entire time. The university um, in their public communications is, they really like the line that they're ready and willing to bargain at any time and they have their calendars cleared. But in fact, the state appointed mediator has advised them to not bargain more than three times a week because they were not prepared. And they were just wasting time at the table. They had no questions. They had no counters. Um, it was so frustrating. And the fact that a mediator said that, I, it couldn't have been just frustrating to the members in the room. I think it must have been frustrating for, uh, that's my that's my conspiracy theory, is that she's also tired of HR. But maybe that's an overreach. Um, all of our bargaining sessions are open to all members, which has been really cool. It's not something we had, we had done that on occasion before, but not every session, to my knowledge. Um, and it's been so good for helping people get involved to just sit there and see what HR says. Or like, I'm sitting there, I had never been in bargaining before, and one of our trans bargaining team members is talking about her fight with mental health and like life-threatening things that she faced and um yeah i'll say this um there's a faculty member uh from my department classical studies on the hr bargaining team he's just snoozing away while she's talking about her like almost losing her life he's just snoozing away um that there is a radicalization and anger that builds from seeing that in a way that can't happen any other way i think so um in a couple of days, we're going to have another bargaining session. We go all day Friday, nine to five every Friday. And this bargaining session is actually open to the entire public. Everyone gets to come. They're trying to shove it up onto North Campus, but that's not going to work. We're all going to come. We've got Strike Kitchen with lunch prepared. Um, and everyone is going to see what HR has to say in the stonewalling they're doing. In general, at the bargaining table, we've made some creeping movement on some things. We have a handful of really small TAs. Like we're, we've tentatively agreed to give Geo like eight bulletin boards or something in various places. But things that actually cost money of the university in general haven't been TA'd yet. And they're playing a stonewalling game at the table. They want to send a lot of things to arbitration or fact finding. And away from the table on social media and in their uh, communications to the wider community, it's just straight up lies, um, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, as an idealistic person, I want to at least be fighting an enemy who is, you know, creative or good at what they do. It's insulting that we are so good at what we do and they just happen to have more money than us or happen to have more power or money or like... It is very frustrating for an idealistic person to be in this situation. Um, with um, bargaining still happening, but graduation and convocation and things starting to happen, the big thing that our strike hinges on right now is final grades and not turning those in. Some of those grades for grad students, at least I know in my department, uh, faculty scabbed and turned them in. Uh, in fact, some of those grades got turned in and submitted and they were just wrong grades. 
so then they had to get revised because the faculty had stepped in and just had no idea what they were doing. But that's not true for all grades. So grad students still are withholding some grades. And at this point, faculty and lecture. So faculty are not unionized at University of Michigan, but our Flint campus is starting a unionization campaign of tenure track faculty, which is just freaking awesome. Um, but our lecturers are unionized and our lecturers and faculty are also starting to withhold grades, which I like I don't have a lot of labor knowledge, especially at the University of Michigan beyond the last couple of years. I would have thought that was unthinkable um, coming into this strike. I never thought faculty would have withheld grades in solidarity and it's certainly not all of them, but the fact that people are doing it and not just people with tenure, people who are taking risks to support us, um, absolutely freaking incredible. And proof that like the strike is working. If we're not seeing movement at the table, we're seeing movement all across the university and that also counts. All right. Hey, I want to be respectful of y'all's time, but I, I'm done to talk all day. Um, Brian just <laughs> chimed into the chat real quick. Um, at, if we could ask a question about strike activities, such as a strike kitchen, uh, virtual picketing, and and the construction picketing um, with GEO in particular, we're, we're very curious about that. And then maybe a couple of more questions and we'll let you go unless you want to stay. But let's let's talk about that real quick. So the strike kitchen, the virtual picketing and the construction picketing. I'll pitch it to you first, Jager. Yeah, I am. One of my nuggets of wisdom for striking is that you got to strike in a way that makes sense for your community, in a way that makes sense for your union. So we had union members who uh, we knew that our pay was likely going to get docked. So we knew people were going to be hungry and people are going to be out all day. And it's it's a Michigan April. So it snowed on us. It's been 90 degrees. It has rained like it's been all over the place. So you got to take care of people. And we also have members who have food service experience in part because we have multiple jobs because we can't afford to live on our GSI salary. So it just made sense to have a strike kitchen. Um, local churches or other organizations have uh, lent out their kitchen space usually about three times a week, and we provide vegan and vegetarian meals for all strikers, um, usually three three or four times a week. Um, and I think I'm eating better then than I otherwise would. <laughs> um, our strike kitchen is fantastic. There's talks about a strike cookbook being released. Um, but then there's also virtual pickets because a lot of graduate students are away on their research, but like we are bargaining for a contract that affects them or they're in charge of bargaining for it themselves. Multiple members of our bargaining team are not in Ann Arbor or Michigan. They're like in Chicago or abroad. Um, so virtual picketing just makes sense. And virtual picketing can look like a lot of things. On the one hand, a picket isn't just a like labor thing. It's just a place for people to be in community. And so providing that for a virtual setting is also really nice, but it's also a way to do email blasts or phone zaps, anything that just takes a lot of time away from the university and the people in power who are just like taking pot shots at us, saying that like we're greedy children, or I think in 2020 we were called screaming grad students. Um, but having a strike that um, reflects our community means having demands or proposals that come from our community. And it also means finding different ways for people to get involved. So we've had multiple, what we've called knit ins and they are a low sensory impact and low motion impact alternative to picketing. So we do a lot of flyering at those and everyone just comes, brings whatever crafts they want and we are in the way and we are uh, picketing, but we're not shouting. So it's for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to be at a picket line or people who can't walk in circles. I expected maybe a handful of people who brought like crocheting, but like someone brought one of those machines where you like spin wool, people like brought like sketchbooks, people like it was, and people were teaching new skills and like helping with craft. Someone didn't know how to do like one of those paper things for embroidery that washes off or something. We had someone there that knew what to do. <laughs> um, and then we've also had a lot of picket lines that are directed in particular ways. So today, 
We've had an international grad student picket line, which not only we like get chants that are specific to international grad students and affect the or relevant to the issues that affect those students, but also gets those students all in community with each other. Maybe two weeks ago now, we had a picket of trans rage where a bunch of trans people showed up. We had special trans chants. We had trans flags. People That's also tough. showed up with rollerblades and stuff. It was just like a beautiful, joyful, rageful event. Um, and then also just allowing things to organically happen as members come together. So yesterday morning at a construction picket in Dexter, because the construction, A, cost the university a lot of money if they're having to pay extra days and delays. And be just incredible to be like a trans person yelling about trans rights and having tradespeople on your line with you saying like, yeah, listen to them. They're also union. They're also labor. Just incredible solidarity. Um, but also you can have some fun. So yesterday morning at the Dexter Picket, a picketing Olympics broke out. So there was four teams. There was an Olympic sport. There was an audience of a uh, cop that was just watching the site. And they did who can get a poncho on and off the passes, who can come up with the most creative way of picketing, who can come up with the best pant in five minutes. And it's still a picket line. We're still like a serious labor thing, but we're also having fun in community and being creative together. And like finding joy while you're on strike is the only way you're going to be able to have a successful strike because otherwise... Like people say that you're on strike because you're lazy and someone who says that has never been on strike. It's so much work. It is tiring. We're like waking up early to be at these construction sites. We're going to bed late after our meetings and after our planning and we're just walking in circles all day. You have to find joy to sustain yourself. And luckily, community is itself a sense of joy and that's something that comes out a lot in a strike. Rutgers. Same question, but I also got to chime in. I saw a video from Rutgers from the uh, y'all had some music going. We like, we had um, yeah the the uh, there was a jazz. We, well, we had concerts, several concerts. Um, some were planned, some were impromptu. Um, but there's uh, some of the instructors at uh, the Mason Grove School of the Arts, which is our major art school, you know, really well regarded art school. Um, they they broke out the the congas and the drums, and some were some were playing, some were you know, um, saxophones, horns, guitars, um, and so you know we we were jamming. There was a there was one day we had a a rewrite, uh, you know, with Harry Belafonte dying yesterday. I think it was kind of apropos, but there was a rewrite of the banana song, the banana boat song, um, that. Uh, Talked about contract, um, and we had we had what I think was an unofficial theme song. Um, we the, the lyrics to uh, the Bruce the Bruce Channel hit from 1962. Uh, hey baby, uh, I want to know if you'll be my girl. We changed it to Hey Holloway, we want to know if you'll raise our wage. So and we and we sang that over and over again, and it really the the audience the audience the, the strikers were. All of the picketers were, you know, fully bought into it. It, it really was. It became our our uh, our artificial theme song, and um, everybody knew it. Everybody was, you know, we we the other day um, we I mean, it was actually last it was last week we 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 held a big demonstration in front of the board of governors um, meeting, uh, and we then marched down through New Brunswick to um, the location where the um, uh, negotiations were taking place and we're marching through the streets of new brunswick singing this song and then chanting then singing this song and chanting and it's just it, it, it was a a wonderful thing to see um during the strike we had um on the on the first day of the strike there was kind of an impromptu march through town where the strikers on one of our campuses met us at the main campus so we planned that out for tuesday and it turned out that um the uh, WNBC reporter was there. He called in the traffic helicopter. And there, and there's images of from above, you know, 250 strikers walking down the center of New Brunswick, meeting us at the gates of the university. Um, truly an inspirational moment. Um, it, yeah, so you know, f fun is important. Fun was definitely important. We we provided food. We didn't do a kitchen thing, um, but there was a, you know we had concerts. Um, we had um, there was there was we, there was a knitted as well. I think on our newer campus, 
Uh, Rutgers is three has three major urban campuses. Um, the New Brunswick campus is the biggest one. Um, and all together, the three campuses, there are about 69,000 students. Um, you know, so we're, 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 we're fairly large. Um, and, uh, you know, so Newark's a little smaller. They had a knit in, um, Camden's had its own things. There's been teach-ins, uh, there's been some plans for grade in. So until this contract is settled, we still have, um, we have plans. So Saturday, for instance, is Rutgers day. It's, a uh, something that started like in the eighties as a folk festival that now is spread to all of the campuses in New Brunswick. So there are three main campuses, Camden, Newark, New Brunswick, but New Brunswick is essentially five campuses across two towns. So um, we are, one of the things that was, that made, made this strike difficult is, you know, we, we wanted to use an industrial model, you know, where you close down a facility but we have five major campuses and thousands of buildings. You can't shut the buildings down. Um, you just don't have the number of people to do it. So we ended up, even though it wasn't our original plan, we ended up focusing a lot of our attention in certain spots. Um, but, um, oh, wow. That just, I completely lost my thread on that one. <laughs> you're okay you're, you're okay yeah you're no, so um but yeah so we, so we were spread out but we've, we were looking for ways to bring everybody together at various points and um and i think we i think we managed to do that it was a it was a kind of a rowdy fun um you know we leaned into our anger but made sure that um in in doing so we found a reason um to find joy in the whole thing. That connection that we each had for each other, that we were marching for each other, um, allowed us to kind of use the anger in productive ways. Um, I mean, I think, and I think the Jaeger's right. I mean, if you, you gotta have fun. It's, this is, it's long. It was the hottest week of the year. It was, we, we had 90 degree weather in, uh, in April as we were out there. And it was, we had, you know, there were people dealing with heat stroke and, and stuff like that, but you know, when that happened, people like swarmed to them with water and ice, and you know we we took care of each other, and that was really that was really it. So here I'm gonna close you close it off with this question, and this is for the two of you. Um, first off, I want to thank you for being on this show and doing what you're doing and engaging in the struggle that you're engaging in. You know that's really inspiring for us, and we've really enjoyed uh, reporting on what's going on. So my question to y'all is what's inspiring or who inspires you? You know, is it a labor leader? Is it an activist, a musician? It could be anyone, but what inspires you um, is my first question. And then my very final question is, what advice do you have for any graduate student workers that are teetering on the edge of unionizing or teetering on the edge of going on strike? Hank, I'll pitch it to you first. What inspires me? Um, it depends on in what in in this in in this situation. I think my um, my fellow board members and my students. Um, I turned sixty last year, so I know that my involvement in teaching has a has kind of has a shelf life at this point. Um, and a lot of the gains that we're going to win, I will benefit from in the immediate term. But a lot of what I'm doing is really for the people who come up behind me. Uh, and I learned that because, you know, talking to younger to, to younger PTLs, uh, adjuncts, talking to the grad students and talking to students in general, you know, I want Rutgers. I, I'm an alum. I, you know, I'm not doing this because I'm mad at the university. I'm doing this because I want Rutgers to be what Rutgers says it is. And so when I see my students, you know, each class, the, especially, especially the ones who are paying attention, right? Because we know how that goes. Um, you know, when they, when they ask me, I opened every single class with that, with a question, what do you, you know, with, with letting them ask me questions about um, what we were doing, what, how was the union handling things? What was the, were we going to go on strike? Um, they engaged with that. And that really made me feel like I had the energy to keep pushing forward because they were, they were interested in, in what we were doing in a very real way. Um, I think they understood that, um, you know, they wanted to have more access to me and to their other professors um, and, and they were buying in and that, that buy-in from them really, I think, 
helped me kind of go through that and just all the other people who were out there with uh, that I was out there with. Um, it was just, it, it was um, just an inspiring time. Um, you know, I'm, you know, inspired by family. I could, you know, kind of make that list, but, but in terms of this, the labor organizing part, it's the people who I'm working with who inspire me every single day. Um, and as for, you know, grad workers or um, adjuncts, um, we are, the two classes in higher ed who are most precarious. Individually, we have no power. Individual adjuncts have no power at all. We are at the whim of administration. So if I had one thing that I would say uh, to, to, to any adjunct, um, it's my one of the schools I teach had just unionized. They just voted a union in. They just got, they just won their first contract. Um, I'm not really active with that one because I'm, spend all my time at Rutgers. Um, but I, I would say join a union, organize a union, work collectively. Management holds the cards until management is and, and, until workers join together. Um, the work, the only power we have is, you know, it's our labor, but it's also our unity. It's our ability to come together and, you know, create strength in numbers, right? I mean, that's I, I think in the end, you know, all labor organizing comes down to to pulling everybody together and 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 working as a team because, you know, they got the money, they own the facilities, they're not going to listen to us unless we force them to. Okay. Thank you. And Jaeger, same question. What in, what inspires you? What inspires you to do this work? Yeah. So a couple inspirations one of which actually is Rutgers and y'all's strike ban. Um, something about like labor organizing is that whatever we win, that sets a precedent for whoever is currently fighting and whatever methods that they are using to get what they want, someone else can then use. When GEO members saw the strike ban coming out of Rutgers, what I tell you, that is the only thing our Discord wanted to talk about. People are so jealous. A bunch of the organizing chats I'm currently in are just ideas for what our strike song can be. It's <laughs> we are, we are working on it. Um, I I think the current one is I love GEO. Put another dime in the strike fund, baby. That's our current ah, draft. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll give uh, I'll give my uh, colleague Richard credit for that. I think that was him. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> But also, like more more specifically for me, I am so inspired constantly by the queer trans organizers I work with in our queer trans caucus. We are the cutie caucus of the union, <laughs> a bunch of cuties. Um, the way so we've been working together for over a year now. In I mean, we are on the front lines of this contract and bargaining at the table in a way that other people aren't because our identities are on the line and perceived a lot. Um, and we have organized always with consensus and the importance of community, which is so hard to maintain in a strike or in a democratic union. It is so hard to make sure people are heard, especially people who usually are not heard. And it's so inspiring to me to be able to work with the organizers in the CUTE caucus. And then one more specifically for me is... Um, so I, I mentioned we've had it a little bit rough in classical studies with our faculty and in general, the field of classical studies um, were a little behind the times. But on Monday of this week, um, the classical studies community launched an open letter in support of the graduate students of a classical studies program at Michigan and in condemnation of the University of Admin uh, University Administration. And I mean, we hit like 300 signatures within a day, which is big for classical studies. We are not a big department. Um, and it, just reading scholars' names on there, where it's like, oh my gosh, an entire chapter of my dissertation is on this person's work. And this person thinks unionization of grad students is important and thinks that we shouldn't be treated this way. I never thought that was possible for my wow. field. Um, so then I... Uh, talking to people who are like thinking about unionizing or like on the road to unionizing, um, it's a lot of work and it's always going to be. And anything that is worth doing at a university is going to be a lot of work just because the cards are stacked against you. And that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. 
And the reality for grad students is some of our unpaid labor, like a significant portion of our unpaid labor is service work. So if we're going to be doing service work anyway, we might as well do it in service of the union too, because that's going to be service work that changes the university for everyone who comes after us. And then specifically in classical studies, um, departments are being cut a lot. We're uh, one of the main liberal arts, liberal studies types of focuses that um, sort of falling to the, the businessification of higher education. And one of the best ways to fight that is unionization. It's a lot harder to get rid of us when we're all fighting together. So if people are worried about the future of academia or the future of their field, or like what world of academia that future students are going to go into, we can take immediate action in making that world better by working with our unions and doing unionization. And also just reach out. Any like. I have talked to so many people at other organizations, other universities about unionizing. A lot of um, our campaign came from talking to people at other unions. This is a group effort across all unions, and we got to be working together. And there is a lot of strength in being able to rely on each other. Yeah, we, we, you know, we did the same thing. We had... Um... You know, as we were going through the earliest stages of this and all the way up until like weeks before the strike, we were we talked with people from NYU, the new school. Um, I think I, I was doing I was interviewing people from Northwestern, you know, Cal, University of California, Cal State system. Um, we we talked, you know, we, we we're talking to people and there are a couple of organizations at the national level now that have formed one um, higher education labor united. Um, uh, one of our officers, Todd Wolfson, he's also teaches in my department. He um, he is one of the founders of the group, and it's um, you know they're the goal of of Hilu is to address all of these concerns and to make the and to kind of create a national model and a national discussion. We have to. One of the things that was has been gratifying about all of this is that we're starting to hear the national part of the conversation about why grad workers and adjuncts and and higher ed is what why there's this unrest. Um, these are not individual fights. Each one of these fights is part of the larger problem with corporate higher ed and 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 you know the um the the casualization of the workforce and 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 the you know the the attacks on humanities programs the kinds of bullshit that we're hearing from like rick desantis as he does he you know pretends he's going to run for president and 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 the other and the other um politicians who want to do things like what they did um in, in wisconsin where they're you know premiums on um people going to humanities they got to pay more intuition that's ridiculous right so this is a national fight. Each of us, both of us that are here, we are, you know, we are like small nodes within this. Um, but if Michigan, if Michigan and Rutgers can win these things, that's huge because that's, a, you know, we're talking about major public institutions with reputations um, that have national attention. Um, you know, we're just part, we're part, we're part of this larger framework, I think. Right on. Well, thank you, Jaeger, and thank you, Hank, for being on. Y'all are welcome back to the show at any time with any updates, <laughs> with any other striking workers or non-striking workers or unionizing, whatever the case may be, y'all are welcome back on the show. <clears throat> you know, we really appreciate y'all giving us insight into, into your struggles because it lets us on this show talk about union democracy, intersectionality, um, cross-union solidarity, stuff like that. So thank you for, you know, putting your stuff out there and catching up with us. Again, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, we're going to dedicate today's show uh, to the spirit of Harry Belafonte. And we're also going to dedicate this show to the spirit of Paul Robeson. So thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be Paul Robeson, Rutgers grad. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening. And catch us again soon. Have a good day, everyone.